Trump won. And I, and I like to say that I hope that I helped him win the presidency because I would get up in front of 25,000 people at rallies going leading into the 2016, and I would introduce him as the most imperfect guy you're ever going to vote for president. Huh. And people would go nuts. American people don't want perfection. American people want somebody who loves this country, somebody who loves this country, and somebody who actually sounds like they know what they're doing. And then when they get in, and, 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 and again— he, was a, he proved himself in his own track record as a businessman in the media and all this. So he had a bit of a proven track record. Now he's, been in the, now he's been a president, and he's got a great proven track record with all of the craziness that he's had to deal with, to include guys like me being cut out from underneath his knees, right? And, and there was some, and this, this is not just on the Democrats or on Obama. Okay, there are some, and we call it the Uniparty, you know, the— we, we, we define the uniparty in this book. So there are some in the uniparty in the establishment of Washington, D.C. that likes the way things are operating. And some of those were right inside the White House. OK. And and uh, so they were they were already surrounding him. And they definitely did this to a degree in the campaign. But I don't think we realize it to the degree that we realize that I realize it later. He definitely has realized it um, now. As many people and as great of an enterprise as he has in this in the whole Trump orbit, you know, you, you still when you get into politics, when they say it's a blood sport, it's a death cult. OK, it's not a blood sport. It's a death cult and they will kill you. Now, these days, like I said, it's a, they kill you by narrative now. So so there are people in and around the inner circle that also were part of this. I mean, he had the two houses Right. The tricameral system we got judiciary, legislative and executive. He had the the uh, the legislative on his team for the first two years. Build the wall. Right. P a pass all kinds. Man, did he have a tough time? Why? Because the people that were there hated him. They hated him more than they loved this country. And, you know, so. I mean, you, you got me on another one of these that, soapboxes. Are those people that he had? There's, some of them are still there. Some of them are still there. Some of them are running for president. Some of them are, are, are external to the, um, the, uh, the Washington, D.C. circle, but they're now in places in the media, and they're, you know, they're doing other little they're, – they're, they're out there still, and they're still uh, wanting to get mm -hmm. – I, actually, they're still on somebody's payroll in some cases. Well, this goes back to my initial question. So these are things. Of, so no, I'm sorry, yes, sir. So these are things that get back to your your uh, your great question, Pat. These are things that I know. Okay, know going in. So these aren't things that I'm just now imagining. Okay, or these aren't conspiracies, right? These are things or conspiracy theories. These are things that I knew going in, and and I'm trying to also take a take a national security apparatus. Okay, you can look at all the agencies and activities, but also the, the, the structure of people inside the White House. I walk into the White House, so under, under the cold, during the Cold War, at the height of the Cold War, where we had nuclear against nuclear, uh, we had national security advisors that had like 25 to, to 40 people inside the White House. Work, you know, in, when, in the White House, there's a, there's a couple little buildings around it, but like less than 50 people at the height of the Cold War, where we had a half a million troops stationed over in Germany— are over in Europe, half a million today, we barely, and we, today we might have, you know, 60, 60, 70,000, half a million with all kinds of capabilities to go to war, right? We had maybe 25 to 50 people in the national security team of the White House. When I walk in the door, there's 500 people, 500 people. You know, you, again, you, you know, you, you swing a cat, you're going to hit somebody that's on the national security staff. You see all these people in the media that sit on places like this and, you know, national, you know, national security something, right? I mean, so many people. If you need an expert, if you need an expert in the White House, you go ask for one. I want an expert on, on business or entrepreneurship or gold. or what. I'll get somebody. I'll reach out to the best in the world, certainly the best in this country. I don't need to have 500 people wandering around the halls wondering what the hell they're going to do. I, I used to call them when I did go to the finally go to the Pentagon. I used to call them wall walkers, wall walkers, because you would go down the hallways of the Pentagon. You ever been in the Pentagon? So you get down the hallways of the of the Pentagon and you see people coming. I'm one of these. I like to engage. Right. I like to say, hey, how you doing today? Right. It's the way I am. So you see these people and they'd walk along the wall and they'd just be kind of looking at the wall, like looking at the pictures because they didn't want anybody to grab them. They didn't want anybody to say, hey, 
because if they were afraid if somebody grabbed them, these are wall walkers now in the Pentagon. If somebody grabbed them, they were afraid that they were going to have to go do some work. Okay. And I use that metaphorically because we got a lot of people wandering around in our government right now. So that's, that's the other part about this. It's to say, look, what are we doing? Are we going to have a, federal, a federalism where we're going to have a, a, a bloated government and everything is controlled by Washington, D.C., and, you know, and we're, we're, we have, well, I'll use, I'll use my buddy Klaus and your buddy Klaus, right? <laughs> we own nothing and we're happy, right? We own nothing and we're happy. So when you have that, I know all that. I knew all that going in. And they had to really, they took, and on that 5th of January day, and I keep going back to that because it's public information now. They used the full weight of the resources of the United States government to get the sitting national security advisor who was already chosen by a duly elected president of the United States out of office as fast as they can, as fast as they could. The full weight of all resources in the United States government that they could bring to bear. Okay? And they did. Ultimately, wasn't that on Trump, though? You were forced to resign yeah. because Trump, yeah. he publicly made that speech. He's Trump? a good guy. He's a fine no, guy. Li- no, Trump said but, he lied to me. But you, know, you lied, lied to me. Pence. Trump, Trump, yeah, I said, well, he lied. He lied, right? Right. So, But you yeah. still have his back. I do. How, do. how do you grapple with that? Yeah, it's a big thing. I mean, yeah, because you could you could say, and I've, I've been you know public about it, that could be his worst enemy. Right. right? I sat through I sat through as a cooperating witness with the Mueller inve- the fake Mueller investigation because I knew that there was nothing there. OK. Mm-hmm. And they ask you. So, yeah. So why do I why do I stand with this guy? And it's not so much that I stand with with Trump as a as a as an entity, like a lot of people, you know, people are enamored. They want to get photos. They want to you know, want to get a signed hat. I stand with Trump because right now, unless it's a guy like you or somebody else out there right now, he's the warrior that has put himself and his entire family, his entire enterprise, you know, on the docket to to help this country. I know one thing about Trump. Trump loves America. He absolutely, he dearly, dearly loves America. And when you see somebody in their sort of worst moments, and there was times, in, particularly during the 2016 campaign, that I saw him like that, uh, you know, or that I had conversations, you know, intimate conversations with him about this country— because we, you know, we met 2015, right? I'm not like some, you know, long lost buddy from New York that played baseball with him, right? I mean, and um, and it, and he loves his family. So I, so when I and I saw him do things to f- for people, for just the regular guy or regular gal. I saw him do things when nobody else was looking. In the military, you know, you're judged. You're judged by what you do when nobody else is looking. Mm. Okay, your standard is your standard when nobody else is looking. You know, you're. You know, you're a lieutenant, you're a private, you're told, pick up the cigarette butts, right? And maybe you're walking down the street and nobody's telling you to do it, but you do it because you just know it's the right thing on a, on a, you know, on a military base or on your yard, right? Somebody throws trash in your yard, nobody's, you know, whatever. This is a guy that loves this country. He loves the direction of this country. He wants to be just like it is, or just like the Constitution allows, where we have another element. And we have a very dangerous element. In this country, very dangerous. And when they say me to me, they point at me and they go, he's a threat to democracy. This isn't a democracy. This is a constitutional republic. But they never say he's a threat to the constitutional republic. You don't hear the parrots out there going. What do you fear the most right now? What are you most concerned about right now with America? I mean, I know we we talk globalism versus nationalism. You got to establish nationalism, nationalism. not nationalism. Uh, Americanism. Americanism. Okay, so what what is your biggest concern? What's the biggest threat we have in America right now? Yeah, I I, uh, I think the speed the speed that things are moving. Uh, I, I I pray that uh, that the speed in which we are moving toward uh, sort of the end the end of times the end times here um, is moving faster than most people uh, can can sense. You know, so that's my my anxiety, I guess, if I if I wake up at times and I think, man, you know, can we do this? Can we, you know, so the speed in which things are happening uh, and I think it's purposeful now. I don't think it's no there's no more hiding of what it is that they're 
they're trying to do. And when I say they to the audience, you know, to you guys here, I mean, it's a it's a it's a it's a globalist crowd. You know, world. If you had a headquarters uh, like you got the commanding general, the 101st Airborne or 82nd, you know, or, or whatever, um, you know, you got the World Economic Forum and, and Klaus Schwab is kind of the face. And then you have. Like he said a couple of weeks ago, we have 600 of the smartest people in the world, right? I mean, so and then you have uh, world bodies, World Health, World Bank, World Trade, uh, International Monetary Fund. Uh, Europe, you can throw the European Union as sort of an unelected subset, uh, United Nations. Uh, and there's other global globalist alliances and bodies. And, we'll, and maybe I'll talk about global alliances. But I, I think the speed at w- that we're moving. So how do you how do you overcome that? You know, how do you overcome that? And uh, and actually, I only because I, I think you you actually I, I use the phrase local action has a national impact. But you uh, you gave f- six or seven uh, things in the end of your uh, your pitch there the other day, which I thought were good in terms of what can people do. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.